Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you this morning just for the privilege and opportunity to come. Lord. And just to receive the word of God on today, we thank you for the insight and revelation that only comes by your spirit. And Father, we yield ourselves to you today, Lord. We open our hearts to receive that which you have for us, Lord. Speak to our hearts, O God. Challenge us. Change us, O God. We yield ourselves to you. We thank you, Father God, for your presence in this place. Lord. And we give you praise, Father. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so on Saturday morning, we've been talking about and uh, sharing with you the question or asking the question, do you want to see good days? And I, and I think that's, a, you know, is, of course, we, we've said that everyone's going to say, of course, I want to see good days. But the question is, how do you define good days? Because your definition of good days may not be the same as God's definition of good days. And, and more than anything else, we should want, as Christians, we should want the Father's definition of good days and not our own. And so we, we, we started out with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and we're going to go back through that again. And there are some things I just want to point out about good days, because there's one thing I said that when we talk about good days, how do we find that? Well, the Bible is very clear about good days and how to find those good days. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse number 10, here's what he says. He says, people who want to live a full life and enjoy good days, must keep their tongues from saying evil things. That's one thing. Number two, and their lips from speaking deceitful things. They must turn away from evil and do good. Now what's good? Good is obedience to God. You can do a lot of things that can appear to be good, but they may not be good because they're not in obedience to God or in obedience to the word of God. Be the word he speaks to your heart or be the word that's in the written word. Um, and number four, he said, we must speak peace and pursue it. Amen. So we got to seek, seek peace. I mean, seek peace and pursue it. Now, we're talking about not seeking peace with the world in the sense that we get in agreement with what the things the world are doing for the sake of peace. We never compromise the word of God and the truth of God's word for peace with people. Uh, sometimes you're going to be divided with people because they are not in agreement with the word of God. So you, you can't have peace with those people. You may desire it, but because of their disagreement with God, and if you're in agreement with God, you're not going to be able to have peace with them. You can love them, but you won't be at peace with them. And then here we say, he said, the Lord's eyes are on those. Well, let me stop right there for a minute, and, and let me say this about this. Notice in these four things, uh, he said, you must keep your tongues from saying evil things, keep your lips from speaking deceitful things, turn away from evil and do good, and seek peace and pursue it. Now, those four things, he said, notice that Peter does not talk about things in relation to good days. He doesn't bring it up things at all. He doesn't say anything about, man, you know, get that house, get that car, man, get that great six-figure job, man. You know, uh, you know take that dream vacation. Or, you know, that's going to have, cause you to have good days. No, everything that Peter talks about in, re in relation to us living uh, a full life and having good days is in relation to our obedience to God. Now, the Bible does say that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. I mean, in other words, God wants you to enjoy life, and the, he wants you to enjoy life and the things that you created, uh, that he created, I'm sorry, the things that he created, but however, those things should not be the pursuit of your life. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that should bring us the greatest joy is our obedience. <laughs> and as we obey God, then we find uh, that our lives are much richer when we obey God. How many of you find that your life is richer when you obey the Lord? Like, you know, you don't have to deal with guilt and all that other stuff that falls along you. You don't have to wake up and drink yourself into a slumber because of the guilt that you feel of the things that happen in your life. You know, you can get up every day and live your life and, and, and walk in the peace of God knowing that, hey, praise God, I'm living a life of obedience. Praise God. That's a wonderful place to live in. Amen. Many people don't live there. Many people, don't, even Christians, don't have peace with God. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't experience the peace of God. Amen. So, look what he says in verse 12. Now, this is something I want to look at about what he talks about in terms of good days and, and a full life. In verse 12, he said, the Lord's eyes, are, the Lord's eyes are, are, are on those who do what he approves. Mm -hmm. Now, highlight that, those who do what he approves. What is that? That's obedience. <laughs> right? Points out, that's obedience. Now, he says, his ears hear their prayer. Mm -hmm. The Lord confronts those who do evil. Who will harm you if you are devoted to doing what is good? Now, how like that again? That, that those words, devoted to doing what is good. What's that? What is good? It's obedience to God. 
So again, he points out, if you want to have full life and enjoy good days, it, it goes back to what? Those who do what he approves and those who are de devoted to do what is good. Now, what's good? Good is obedience. Good is not what you perceive. Good is your, your actions of obedience to God when he tells you to do something, be it by him speaking to you through his spirit or him speaking to you through the word. So whatever the word says do, if he says love your enemies, then you should love your enemies. If he tells you to pray for your leaders, didn't say the leaders you agree with. He said pray for all your leaders. Why? Because everybody needs Jesus. Jesus didn't die for the Democratic Party. Jesus didn't die just for the Republican Party. He didn't die for the Independent. He didn't die for the Millennium. He died for everybody so that everybody would have an opportunity yes. to, know, to know the Father through the Son. Amen. And if you don't have that same compassion for people, then you're really missing out on good, a good life mm -hmm. and good days. Because, again, it's about obedience to God. So let's keep reading here. He says, verse 14, but even if you suffer for doing what God approves, you are blessed. Now notice that. that that's not popular. Even if you suffer for doing, for doing what God approves, you are blessed. Don't be afraid of those who want to harm you. Look what he says. Don't get upset. Don't get upset because they, they pass a law that don't go the way you think it should go. Mm. Don't get upset with that. Pray for them. And stay, look, and stay in your assignment that God has ordained for you to walk in. You know, so, no, let me keep reading. I'll come back to this. Verse 15. He said, but dedicate your lives to Christ. Well, what's that again? How like that? Dedicate your lives. What's that? It's obedience <laughs> to Christ. He goes back to obedience again. He says it. He is saying the same thing in a very, in various ways, in various points, but he just keeps making the same point. If you want to see, uh, have a full life and enjoy good days, it all comes down to this main point. Obey God. Louis says, he said, but dedicate your lives to Christ as Lord. Now notice this, no, no, don't stop here. He said, but dedicate your lives to Christ. He doesn't stop there. He said, dedicate your life to Christ as Lord. Mm. Now you know what Lord means? Lord means supreme authority. Supreme authority means he is one having the right to tell you how to think, mm. He has the right to tell you how to talk. He has the right to tell you how to behave. Come on, amen. See, see, so, so you can't, you should not, as believers, we should not get caught up in our feelings more so than the Lordship of Jesus and what he's telling us to do and what he's telling us to think and what he's telling us to say. We shouldn't allow what the world is doing and what's going on in all the, all the arenas of life. We shouldn't allow those things to pull us away from the Lordship of Jesus. See, anytime you interject I, I means you have just take, taken the Lordship of Jesus and set that to the side because what you, get, you think is more important than what the Lord has said. So you got to kill the I in you. Yes. Do he says here? He says, always be ready to defend your confidence in God when anyone asks you to explain it. However, make your defense with gentleness and respect. Mm. Be respectful when you share your faith with people. Don't just dog people out. You know, you're going to hell. You're going straight to hell because you don't believe them. Well, that's not that's not the love of God. You you convey the truth to them in a way. Jesus didn't tell the disciples to act that way. Excuse me, to act that way. He said if they don't, if you go out and preach the gospel, they don't receive it. He said shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them that they don't want this, and you keep them. Up. Now when he really talks about shaking the dust from your feet, uh, I think I think a portion is just walking away. <laughs> just walk away and find somebody else who wants the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Look at this. Verse 16. He said, keep your conscience clear. Okay, how do we keep our conscience clear? How like that? Because how do we keep our conscience clear? Obey God. Yeah. You want a clear conscience before the Lord? Obey God. Obey the Lord. O obey the Lordship of Jesus. Just do what he says. Think what he says, think, talk the way he says, talk, and do what he says, do. Mm -hmm. Notice, he's saying the same this, He's saying the same thing repeated, repeatedly, but he's just saying it in different ways to us. The way he says is, he said, then those who treat the good Christian life you live with contempt will feel ashamed that they have ridiculed you. Mm -hmm. After all, if it is God's will, 
if, listen, if it's God's will, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. So how do we do good? Obey God. <laughs> so I like that again. Doing good. What's that? Obeying God. That's what doing good is. It's obeying God. Apart from how you feel, apart from what you think, there's no I in obedience. Just do what he says. Amen? Verse 18. This is true because Christ suffered for our sins once. He was an innocent person, but he suffered for guilty people so that he could bring you to God. His body was put to death, but he was brought back to, brought to life through his spirit. In it, he also went to proclaim his victory to the spirits kept in prison. Mm. They are like those who disobeyed long ago in the days of Noah, uh, when God waited patiently while Noah built the ship. Okay, okay, Noah built the ship, right? Let me ask you a question. Why did Noah build the ship? Was it just a good idea? No, he did it. Why? Because the Lord told him to. <laughs> Come on, amen. It, it, so what does, this, what does this go back to? Obedience. So Noah was enjoyed a full life and he enjoyed good days because he obeyed God. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world was condemned because they didn't obey God. Now look at this. In this ship, a few people, eight in all, were saved by water. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. They were saved by water. But for others, water was their destruction. But the thing that was their destruction brought Noah and his family their salvation. <laughs> Come on, amen. Why? Because they obeyed, he obeyed God. The verse 21 says, it's baptism, which is like, like that water, now saves you. Baptism doesn't say by removing dirt from the body. Rather, baptism is a request to God for a clear conscience. My baptism says I'm giving my life and I'm dedicating all of me to him. See, that, that the submersion means, that means the old me is going down. When I'm brought back up out of the water, that means a new me comes up. Which means the old me is left in the water, like dirt. It's left in the water, but the new me comes out and I walk out of the water free and clear. Therefore, my conscience before God is clear. Mm. Now, baptism, water baptism itself doesn't save you. But it, it is only symbolic of the salvation that occurred in your spirit when you received Jesus. You should want to go through water baptism as an indication and a witness to those around you that you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ. You should want to go through water baptism. You should. <laughs> look, look what it says. It, it says, it saves you through Jesus Christ who came back from death to life. Christ has gone to heaven where he has the highest position that God gives. Christ has gone to heaven where he has the highest position that God gives. Angels, rulers, and powers have been placed under his authority. Mm. Now, here's what happened to me uh, just recently. You know, uh, people have been asking me, when I pick them up and you know, drive them, have you voted? Have you voted? I'm thinking, I we haven't really voted in this, this you know, election for mayor and all the councilmen. I, I we haven't voted on that stuff. Oh, you got to vote. You got to vote. And, 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 and I understand why they're saying that because it, it's like there, there's hope in their vote. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to bring, you know, but that don't bring me hope. I'm not saying don't vote either. I'm saying you go vote. But here's my thing. I, I gave up my vote a long time ago because I voted for Jesus to be my Lord. Mm -hmm. And so now when I walk into a booth, I just ask the Lord who he want in there. Who's going to fulfill your word? And that's how I vote. And whoever the Lord put them on to vote for, I don't care what they've said or didn't say. I'm going to listen to Jesus. I'm going to listen to my Lord. I'm not going to make my... Because people here say, well, I got to, you want to be informed. Nobody's more informed than Jesus. So why would I want to rely on my... Me being my capacity to be informed about a person that I don't even know who could just say whatever. Mm -hmm. So they can say what they're going to do, but at the end of the day, Jesus already know what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. So rather than asking them what they're going to do, I just ask him well, who he want in there. Because the Bible says God established his leader for his purpose, not for your taxes. For his purpose, God's trying to fulfill the word. Mm -hmm. God's trying to wrap this up. And I always say this to people. Quit trying to preserve a world that God is ultimately trying to bring to an end. Yes. 
I'm not saying we're helping them along, but I say, I'm saying we, we live a life of obedience to do what we're commissioned to do by the Lord while we're down here to impact the lives of people for the kingdom's sake. Because what if I stand out here for hours and encourage people, vote, 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 vote for somebody, vote for this, or vote for, vote for that person. But if I don't give them Jesus, they still lost anyway. Mm -hmm. So what have I really accomplished in their life? Nothing. Because they still lost. Thinking, yeah, if you vote for the right person, it's going to be okay. I did. I voted for Jesus. And it's going, come on, why? Because the Bible said, what, we, what did we just read? That Christ has gone into heaven where he has, he has the highest position that God gives. Christ has the highest position that God gives. And he is over angels, rulers, and powers have been placed under his authority. You may vote for that person, but I voted for Jesus. And I'm trusting in his lordship. Above everything else. Why? Because I know in Jesus I can have a full life and enjoy good days. Mm -hmm. I was voting before Jesus. And guess what? I was not having a full life and I was not having good days. But when I voted for Jesus, Jesus be my Lord. I, you can't vote for him to be Lord and then take it back and go vote for somebody else. That's what you're doing sometimes when you go to the poll and you're voting with your hope in these people. Mm -hmm. That it will change things for you. You're saying you, you, you have more expectation that they're able to do something for you that Jesus can't do. Mm. But yet God has placed Jesus in the, in the highest position that he can give. So that means the heart of the king is in, is in his hand. He can turn whatever way he wills. And God's not trying to preserve the world. God's trying to preserve people. Mm -hmm. But this world is coming to an end. And you look at it, it's getting worse. But even at this, no matter how bad the world gets, you can still keep living in good days because you are living in the will of God. Well, amen. This is, many people worry about what's going on in their lives because they are trying to figure out how, how things are going to work out. Mm. Listen, worry, worry will keep you from good days because embracing worry is an indication that an individual does not trust God. 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 6 through 9 says this. It says, be humble by God's power so that when, you, when the right time comes, he will honor you. Mm. Turn your anxiety over to God because he cares for you. What's anxiety? It's worry. He says, you're supposed to take your anxiety and give it over to God. Listen, he, you, you don't sit down with God. This is to counsel him about your worry. Because that's what people try to do. I'm going to go talk to God about this work. Now God didn't say, to, he didn't tell you to talk to him about it. He told you, in fact, King James said, cast it onto him. You know what you do when you cast something? You throw it away. In fact, I, 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 the, the analogy God gave me was when I was a little boy, we would like to go to the lake. And you know how you would uh, like to skip rocks on top of the water. You throw it, and you always try to find the flat rock because the flat rock skip real good. And but you go out there and you try to make it skip, and you you cast it. And, and and so when you when you did it just right, it would skip across the water. Maybe and you did the count, you know, to to see who wins. And you get more skips on the water, you know, you win. And and so, but once I cast that stone away, no matter how much I I, I embraced that stone because it was what I needed. When I cast that stone away. There was no getting it back. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn how to cast our cares on God like that. To throw them to such a degree that we can't get it back. Mm. But we don't do that. No, we tie a line to our worries and throw them and kind of toss them to God so that if he don't fix it as fast as we want him to fix it, we reel that baby back in. And we go back to the world to try to find an answer from the world. So guess what we do? We go to, to the political booth. We got to vote for somebody. We got to vote for somebody. I, I already voted. Jesus, it, it, he's still on the throne. Come on, am I making sense? Yes. And I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm not telling you it's, it's in vain to vote. Uh, but here's the thing. Every time I vote, my vote is an agreement with God. Mm. Not on what I perceive that person going to do for me. Every time I vote, I, I vote on the basis of, Lord, who do you want? If he says who, who to vote for, because they're going to fulfill his word, I vote. You say, but they, they made things worse. Good. That means the worse things get, the closer I am, close to going home. Mm. Unless you see this world as your home. 
I know that's not a popular view to take. I understand that people know now. I don't think that you can do what you want to do. But I found this that when I gave up my vote, I embraced my peace mm -hmm. because I want what I'm saying to Jesus. I trust in you, not in them. Uh. So if my if my quote man didn't get in, don't bother me at all because my man is always in because he's always on the throne and to his kingdom there should never be an end. Just saying, you do what you want to. But I just found my life to be real good when I just let Jesus be Lord. Yes. All right. Then we said, but now the word humble, he said, be humble. Now he, I thought I saw this, I thought it was really interesting. But he says, be humbled by God's power. Be humble by God's power. What does that say? Now, what is what is what does it mean to be humble? It means it means not it means uh, not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive. It means reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of deference or submission, or, or, or submission. Meaning, humility means I give up my way, and I take up his way. I lay down my opinion, and I take up his will. I give up my desire, and I take up his desire. Mm. That's humility. Humility says I'm going to follow in your path rather than following in my own path. Mm. That's humility. Has nothing to do with what you drive. Has nothing to do with what you live in. It, it just has everything to do with your heart is concerned that you're going to submit yourself to the instruction and leading of the Lord for your, where your life is concerned. And you're going to find in that submission, that humility to, to let, let God be God over your life that you said you did it when you got born again. That means I'm going to let him lead me to a full life and good days for me. See, humility or, or being humble does not mean being a doormat. The meaning of humility in the Bible is not one of groveling in front of other people. It, it means I'm submitting myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm giving myself to Him. Now, remember we said earlier that many people worry about what's going on in their life because they're trying to figure out how, to get, how things are going to, to work out. You know, but here's the thing. If I'm really humble... And the Lord has already said, take no thought, saying, mm -hmm. what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? He said, but after all these things do the Gentiles seek. He said, but you first seek. He said, your father heaven know that you have need of these things. He said, but first seek ye the kingdom of God mm -hmm. and his righteousness, mm -hmm. and that all these other things will be added into you. Then he says, fear not, little flock. It is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And in other words, God is saying, I want to bless you more than you want to be blessed. Mm -hmm. And I delight in you being blessed. But, but you can't make the being blessed more important than your obedience. You can't let your desire to get things override your willingness to submit to me and follow my lead. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened. And many times, that's the type of gospel we preach to people. God will bless you real good. He'll give you this, give you that, give you, give you, give you. And we have created a generation of believers who serve God out of what they can get, not out of what they can give. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. See, I want to see good days, do you? Mm. All right, so I'm going to, going to go back. And again, I talk about this because about the worry and anxiety issue because many people worry about stuff. And, 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 it's, and, they, and the reason why they worry is because they take their counsel from the world. Yes, yes. I don't care what the world says. I don't trust it. Even when it's good, I don't trust what the world says. I trust the Lord. The Bible says trust in the Lord. With all your heart. Now, if I give him all my heart, is there any room to have trust anywhere else? No. Now, I can trust people who have his spirit in the sense that I have friends that I trust. You know, if I say I need something, they say I'm going to do it. I have friends that I, I'll, I'll, I'll trust. But here's the thing. Even in trusting them, if they don't come through, I don't get offended at them. Mm -hmm. because, if, if, because I can always trust in the Lord. So if they don't come through, that's all right. I can still love them. I'm not going to make them feel guilty. I'm not, you, you told me you were going to be there for me, and you weren't there for me, and blah, blah, you know, and getting an offense towards them. Why do all that and get out of the love of God? Mm. No, okay, you didn't come through. I forgive you because I know life happens. Sometimes things come up. I, it's not a problem. Now, I might not be real apprehensive to call you the next time, amen, but I know I can always trust the Lord, and I don't have to be offended at you. Come, amen. And see, when you don't walk in offense and worry, you can live in good days. Mm. Have you found that when you walk in the love of God, life is real sweet?
when people just can't get to you? It's like, okay, whatever. I don't like your God. I don't believe in your Jesus. Okay, cool. God bless you. I didn't be praying for you. But see, when you live like this, great. Because you can't offend. The Bible says we're not to be easily offended. Mm. Wait, man. It should take a lot to offend you. So uh, let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to look at, look at Solomon. And uh, I, I, I was thinking about this because I think about this. Remember what I said the first thing in 1 Peter? That when he talks about the things that we needed to uh, refrain from doing and, and keeping ourselves from, I think he doesn't mention things at all. He doesn't mention stuff. He doesn't mention you know, getting a big house, getting a big, you know, a big bank account. He only talks about your obedience. If you want to see a, have a full life and see good days, you know, ultimately it comes down to be obedient to the Lord. Submit to Christ as Lord. Not just Christ, but Christ as Lord. Mm -hmm. You need to submit to his lordship, which means you've got to submit to his leading. Now in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, and this is the, 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 the writings of Solomon concerning his view of, of life. And uh, now if you know anything about Solomon, Solomon was, there was no, no king more wealthy than Solomon. When God came to Solomon at a very young age and asked Solomon, what do you want from me? What did Solomon say? He said, I want, I want wisdom so I can judge your people. Because who can, who can judge these people besides you? So I need, really need you to judge these people through me. So I need your wisdom. And the Bible said the answer so pleased God that God said, Solomon, boy, I like your answer. Boy, you, were, you, didn't, you, didn't, you, didn't, come for, you didn't ask me for the riches. You didn't ask me for long life. You didn't even ask me for the death of your enemies. But you asked for something that reflected my heart. And what Solomon, because of your, 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 your response to my question, I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for. I'm going to make you wise, Solomon. I'm going to make you so wise that there will no one be as wise as like you as ever before. You're going to be awesome in your wisdom. The wisdom of God is going to flow through you, Solomon. But here's another deal. Because your answer pleased me, it reflected my heart. I'm not only going to give you that, but I'm going to give you peace all around you for, for all of your days. Come on, I'm going to keep you from your enemy. I'm going to make you wealthy. So nobody will be as wealthy as you, Solomon. Praise God. You're going to have a real, in other words, you're going to have a real good life. And you will have a full life because your answer pleased me. Yes. Give God an answer that please, and he'll, he'll, sort of, he'll bring peace to your life. Mm. Amen. There was nobody more richer than the Bible. They talk about how Solomon was sending ships out empty, and they would return full of gold. Everybody liked working for Solomon, because Solomon paid people well. He wasn't cheap. He talks about how the, the, the silver and the silver that he, that he collected, he would just throw that out back, because it was just so much. It's, and we would call that waste, but God called that favor because he gave God an answer that pleased him. Come on, amen, hallelujah. God, God will bless you if you give him answers that please him and you follow through with those answers. Mm. So this is the guy who had all that stuff, who was more wealthy than anybody. The, the, the wealth that Solomon had cannot even be com compared to that, compared to what people have. Billionaires don't mean nothing to Solomon. Can't touch Solomon. And the wealth that he possessed. Mm. And God made him that because he told God, I just want your wisdom so I can judge these people with your heart. Mm. Mm. And the Bible said that God was pleased with this answer. Don't you want to give God an answer that pleases him? Mm. I mean, seriously. He didn't, he didn't contrive that answer because he heard somebody else give that answer. Because sometimes we try to give God answers that are contrived because we heard somebody else give that answer. We're going to give the same answer, you know. And God will make me rich too. Now, your motive is wrong. Solomon, would, Solomon did not have peace from his enemies in his mind. He didn't have long life in his mind. He didn't have riches in his mind. He simply had one thing. Lord, I just want wisdom so I can judge these your people. Because mm. nobody can judge them but you. Mm. Man, my God, my God. Yes. So we're talking about this dude. All right? We're talking about this guy. Now look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. And here's what Solomon said concerning all the things that he had and all that he possessed. He said, the words of the spokesman, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem, absolutely pointless, says the spokesman. Absolutely pointless. Everything is pointless. What do people gain from all their hard work under the sun? Mm. Listen, now this is, I don't believe that Solomon is speaking against having things. I believe that what Solomon is dealing with here in the book of Ecclesiastes are the motivations for why people want what they want. Mm -hmm. And thinking that these things, if I get these things, then I'll have full life and good days. 
No, and, and, and he said, no, that's pointless. These things will not give you full life and good days. Because how many kings had all this stuff too, had, had wealth too, and look, it, it led to their ruin. Mm -hmm. Many people have money and it doesn't do them any good. Mm -hmm. It just enslaves them. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the first thing he opens with. So I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to read the end of the book and, and what he concludes. And here's, here's what he opened with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. He says, remember your creator mm. when you are young. Before the days of trouble come and the years catch up with you. Because remember, God came to Solomon when he was young. And God gave him all this stuff when he was young. But when he got older, he got in trouble. Because the day of trouble showed up. It didn't show up because of God. It showed up because he disobeyed. But God honored his word to him and still kept peace around him all of his days. He said, remember your creator when you are young, before the days of trouble come and the years catch up with you. They will make you say, I have found no pleasure in them. What is he saying? That with all this stuff, without my creator, they still will not bring me pleasure. Yes. They won't, they won't satisfy me. And somewhere in the back of people, my people, you tell people this, but somewhere in the back of people, they hold on to they you know, but I got to get my stuff, I get my stuff, I need stuff, be having need stuff, there. And here's another people say. Here's another thing that I've heard people say, and, and and that is, well, you know, you you know, you need stuff to, to minister to people. You know that certain people won't listen to you if you don't have stuff. You know, but here's what Jesus said. Now, now I weigh that with what that person tells me, and I weigh that with what Jesus said. And here's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, if they kept my word, they'll keep your word. If they hated me, they go hate you. Jesus didn't say, well, you know, guys, you just collect this kind of, this kind of uh, high position now, and these people listen to you. He never told them that. He said, if they kept my word, they will keep your word. Mm -hmm. That tells me it's not about my position in terms of, in the, in the position of men, but it is my position before God, because the Bible says God will bring me to the people he needs to bring me to. Ah. The disciples were brought before kings and rulers and leaders. Even though they were there because they were in trouble. <laughs> but when they got there, they always shared the gospel. Mm. So they had an opportunity to share the gospel with kings, even though they did not have the financial, the financial status that those kings had, God still opened up doors to get them in there. And what God used to get them there was trouble. Ah. <laughs> Come on, boy, glory to God. He used the trouble to get them there. He, he, them preaching the gospel got them in trouble, and them getting in so much trouble and causing such an uproar in the city because of the gospel. They, they were brought to rulers and kings, and they began to share with the rulers and kings their testimony. Come on, Paul was brought, brought to King Agrippa and, and, and chains, and standing there in, in the front of King Agrippa with chains, and, and, he, and he, Paul began to testify about his encounter with Jesus, and King Agrippa said, boy, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. But God gave King Agrippa an opportunity to hear the gospel from somebody who was not in a, quote, a, a, a financially high standing position. Right. But he was standing high in the kingdom of God. And God can turn the heart of the king towards your favor to bring you to, before him so you can share the gospel with him. God, if God want to get you there, he'll get you there. And he don't have to go the world's way to get you there to share the gospel. God has many ways to get you to a place where, where you can share the gospel with people. Because for God, that's all that's about is about people mm. and influencing people with the truth of the gospel mm. concerning Jesus Christ. Mm. In fact, Jesus told the disciples when you brought Jesus told him when you brought before these rulers and these kings, he said, Don't meditate in your heart what you go say. He said, in that moment, the Holy Ghost will give you exactly what you need to say to that person, which means I have equipped you guys with my spirit to speak the kings and rules so that you don't have to feel intimidated because you're not on their financial status or in their financial or their physical position of authority in the world because there's a position, fellas, you have in me that's greater than any position that any man in the world has. And if you just stick with me, I'm, I'm the one who oversees it all, and I'll get you there to speak to them, to share the gospel. Glory to God. Woo, isn't that good? Look at verse 2 in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He says, remember your creator before the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars turn dark, and the clouds come back with rain. Mm. Remember your creator when those who guard the house tremble, strong men are stooped over, 
and the women at the mill stop grinding because there are so few of them. He said, when you come, when you facing trouble, he said, look, he said, because you're going to face trouble. No matter everything that Solomon possessed, he, he came to the clue in his old age that he realized that none of these things stop trouble from showing up. Mm. He says, in, in the midst of all that, remember your creator. He said, remember your creator, verse 3. He said, remember your creator when those who guard the house tremble. In other words, people will start looking shaky around you. Come on, amen. The people that are supposed to be guarding you, they become, they become, they, they start, they stop looking towards you and they start becoming disloyal and they start thinking about themselves because we always get fearful when we think about ourselves. We get worried when we think about what's going to happen to us because things aren't going as good as they used to go. All right. He's a strong man, I stooped over. I don't know if that's because of age or what, but you know, at some point, a strong man may lose his strength. He said the women at the mill stop grinding because there are so few of them, meaning they don't have the strength to push those grinders anymore. Mm. And those who look out of the windows see a dim light. Why? Because their eyes are getting old. Mm. And they don't see the way they used to see. But he says in verse 4, remember your creator when the doors to the streets are closed. When opportunities are not available to you because the doors are closed, he said, remember your creator. He said, the sound of the mill is muffled. And you are startled at the sound of a bird. And those who sing songs become quiet. He said, when everything starts going dark in your life, he said, do one thing. Remember your creator because the things and the stuff can't help you. Only your creator can help you in times of trouble. Verse 5, he says, remember your creator when someone is afraid of heights and of dangers along this road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and the capper bush has no fruit. Mortals go, mortals go to their eternal rest, and mourners go out in the streets. He says, remember your creator. Verse 6 says, remember your creator before the silver cord is snapped. The golden bowl is broken. The pitcher is smashed near the spring. And the water wheel is broken at the cistern. Then the dust of mortals go back to the ground as it were before. And the breath of life goes back to God who gave it. Mm. He said, verse 8, absolutely pointless. He's all this stuff that you're looking towards and things and possessions. He said, no. He said, the one thing you need to do above everything else, remember your creator. Look at verse 9, he says, besides being wise, the spokesman also taught the people what he knew. He very carefully thought about it, studied it, and arranged it in many proverbs. The spokesman tried to, to find just the right words. He's talking about himself. He wrote the words of truth very carefully. The words from wise people are, are like spurs. Their collected sayings are like nails that have been driven in firmly. They come from one shepherd. Be warned, my children, against anything more than these. What is he saying? You need the wisdom of God. He's be warned against this. Look what he says here. People never stop writing books. Mm. Too much study will wear out your body. After having heard it all, this is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commands because this applies to everyone. God will certainly judge everything that is done. This includes every secret thing, whether it is good or bad. Solomon came to the conclusion that as I'm trying to help you come to the conclusion, understand that you and I have the responsibility to remember our creator. And the good news is that through Christ, he is not simply our creator, creator, but he is our father. And we serve the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And that we place our trust and our confidence in him. We don't put our trust and confidence in things. Nothing wrong with having things. But I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. And I'll not lean to my own understanding. But in all my ways I will acknowledge him. And he will direct my path. This is what will allow you and me and us to enjoy full life and good days. When we remember our creator not just in the good times. But all that things that you have right now, that you may lose all of that, but still, in the midst of all that, 
Remember your creator. Glory. And remember the power that he possessed to be humbled by his power. Because no matter what comes against you, nothing that comes against you is greater than your creator. Ah. Glory to God. Amen. So we're going to wrap this series up today telling you, uh, this, reminding you of this. That if you want to see good days, if you want to live a full life, remember your creator. Live a life of obedience to Jesus. Submit yourself to the will and word of God. He knows what you have need of, but he's already supplied your needs. He just needs you to follow him so that as you follow him, he will manifest what you need as you go. Many times we want everything up front and, and, uh, up front and comfortable, but I found over my life that many things only come as I pursue God, that as I'm moving in the things of God, I find that the blessings of the Lord began to overcome me and overtake my life as I serve him. And many times he blessed me in ways that I didn't even realize that what looked like a bad thing was turning into a blessing. <laughs> let me tell you something about Solomon. You, you, you must remember what he said. Remember your creator while you're young. Mm. Because the day is going to come when trouble is going to show up. The day is going to come when you can't do what you used to do. Your eyes are going to dim. The, the prosperity that you may experience now may, may, may fade away. But be, be humbled by the power of your creator. Because he's well able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can even imagine or think according to the power that's working in you. And that power that's working in you is the spirit of God. And if you will learn to submit yourself and follow the leading of God's spirit, he will lead you to a full life and good days. Now, now what's a, good, a full life? A full life is when you live a life that completes the, the race that God established for you. You might finish your full life at 50, but if you finish it knowing that you've done everything that God has called you to do, that is a full life. All right. Hallelujah. And good days is when we just simply live our lives in obedience, following the, the instructions and leadings of the Lord. Amen? So I pray that bless you. I pray that that would encourage you. The question was, do you want to see good days? I, I, I would pray you would say yes, but remember those good days are only found in your obedience to the Lord. Yes. Amen? Yes. We'll pray God, but let's pray and we'll, we'll let you go. Amen. Father God, we thank you for the word. We thank you, Father God, for the people. And we just pray, Father God, that you would help us to live a life that is truly pleasing to you, truly pleasing to your will and your word. We thank you, Father God, for all that you've done for us. Lord, help us to, to not live life so selfishly that we simply look to ourselves and look at ourselves and look for our desires and our wants, but that we will truly set aside our lives to truly be your ambassador and, and truly mm. say to you, Lord, not our will, but your will be done. That we wake up every day saying, Lord, what do you want from me? Mm. How may I serve you? Whose life can I touch for you on today? Lord, we love you. We thank you for it. And we just give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.